Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. I was asked by one of my colleagues this morning, I mean, why, why do we get involved with events like this where you invite people and you have a talk and all that stuff? Why don't you just go out and actually do something about it, right? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom and a very good afternoon. Yang amat berbahagia, Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, President of the Perdana Global Peace Foundation, members of the Board of Trustees of VGPF, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking all of you for taking your time off in accepting the invitation by VGPF to this afternoon's talk by Miko Palat on a subject that comes into the hearts and minds of each and one, every one of us who loves and aspire as well as a desire for peace in this world. Why is the son of an Israeli general talking for the Palestinians? I do not have the answer. He has the answers. But maybe I can tell you why a retired Malaysian general is introducing the son of an Israeli general. Anyway, on a more serious note, our guest speaker today hails from a well-respected and established Israeli family. His grandfather was involved in the signing of the Israeli Declaration for Independence. His father served in the Israeli Defense Force in the 48th War and 67th War, rising to the rank of Major General. And he himself, like father, like son, did his three years of military service with the Israeli Defense Force. And he comes from a family that has decided that the only way forward, the road for a stability, for stability in that part of the world is none other than peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I have to uh, begin by saying what, I, what an ex extraordinary experience it's been for me to be here in Malaysia for the last few days. And it's not an issue, of pol it's not a political issue, it's a moral issue. And again, Malaysia has taken leadership role in that, and I could only hope that others will follow. I think this is an issue that is so, people find it confusing and puzzling, mostly because there is so much disinformation or misinformation out there. There are so many different variations and versions of the truth. There is so much double standard. That you have to, that, that it's hard to sift through and, and reach a conclusion. Um, you know, Dr. Mahathir earlier in his comments today talked about the fact that when you criticize the state of Israel, you're called anti Semitic. What does that even mean? What about all the Jewish people that criticize Israel? There are many, many Jewish people around the world that have never supported Israel, and to this day, either criticize the actual existence of the state of Israel in Palestine and criticize Israeli policies against the Palestinians. So does that mean that if you oppose the state of Israel, a state that holds thousands of political prisoners, a state that has racist laws against half of its population and exclusive rights for uh, Jewish Israelis like myself only, and a state that on a regular basis bombs Palestinian areas, knowing full well they're going to kill civilians, as a policy. <coughs> so supporting that is good, and opposing that is anti-Semitic. Am I the only one that sees how, how absurd this is? Of course, it's an absurd, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an absurd idea, and it's an absurd notion, and it's absolutely not true. But it comes from people who have no moral argument. They have nothing else to say because there is no argument that can justify Israeli policies against the Palestinians. So they come out with all these, all these words, all this name calling, which of course is childish. 
Another thing that people find confusing, I certainly find confusing, when we listen to the way people talk about this issue, particularly in the West, there is the issue of what, what was it that founded the state of Israel, the ideology, so to speak. It's called Zionism. And the Zionists claim, they were, you know, Zionism began 100, maybe 120 years ago or so, and their claim was that because today's Jewish people, the Jewish people of today, are the ancestors, are the, are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews that lived in that area some two, three thousand years ago, that they have a right to return. And the word that is used is return, as though the Jews left two weeks ago and now they're coming back, as opposed to two thousand years ago. And this has become acceptable. And I think this is one of the brilliant aspects of the Zionist movement, is that they were able to convince the powers that be that this was a reasonable thing to, 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 a reasonable thing to accomplish, a reasonable thing to, um, to work for, the return of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland. And today, this is, this is acceptable. Jews have a right to return. This is how people think. But, when we bring up the issue of the right of return of Palestinians, who left their homes or were forced to leave their homes only 65 years ago, this raises a red flag, and nobody's willing to talk about this. This cannot be put on the table for, for discussion. Why? Because it happened a long time ago, and Palestinians need to forget. This is the argument. You hear this over and over again. Palestinians need to forget this was in the past, it was a long time ago. So in case I didn't make myself clear, we have a situation where people have accepted this reality where a people who claim their right from something that happened two or three thousand years ago are telling a people who still have the keys to their homes and the deeds to their land and remember the day they were forced to leave, 65 years ago, that they have to forget because their claim is too old. And the absurdity of this is that this is how the conversation, this is how the discussion on the issue of Palestine is conducted. These absurd ideas have become truth. They have become the foundation for the debate. So is there any wonder we're stuck in the mud? Now, there are two claims that are made about this issue which I find very troubling. The first one is that those people over there have been killing each other for thousands of years, and therefore it's hopeless. Well, they haven't been killing each other for thousands of years. Most of them have not even been there for thousands of years. But it means just don't talk about it, don't do anything about this, it's hopeless. And of course the other claim is that this is too complicated of an issue. So there's nothing we can do, which is again, it's kind of a code for saying, don't touch this, it's hopeless. Which means allow things to continue the way they are. And both of these claims are not true. It's not that complicated, it's not easy, but it's not that complicated, and it hasn't been going on for thousands of years, and I think, in fact, we can actually pinpoint a time in history where we can begin to talk about this conflict. And I have to apologize, some of the slides are a little distorted. For the partition resolution, the United Nations decided we'll partition the land, we'll have a state for the Jews, a state for the Palestinians, for the Arabs, and all will be well. And on the face of it, it sounds like a reasonable idea. But of course, the devil is in the details. To begin with, look at this map. Can you imagine being the person that has to go on the ground and mark the boundaries? Can you imagine the general whose forces have to defend these boundaries? How do you, how do you even go about uh, finding them on the ground? It's an, absurd, uh, it's an absurd drawing. But beyond that, what's absurd is this. In 1947, the Jewish community in Palestine numbered about half a million people. Most of them, were, were immigrants like my grandparents and their children who were born there like my parents. The native Palestinian Arab community numbered close to a million and a half, so three times more. Somehow though, the United Nations, when they came up with this partition plan, they decided to give the larger portion of the country to the smaller community. And to this day, people blame the Palestinians because they rejected the partition plan. Was there anybody in their right mind that thought they would not reject this plan? That the United Nations would come, slice off the larger portion of their country, and give it to really just a small group of immigrants who all just literally came off the boat. 
how did anybody think this was going to work? And I don't think anybody thought it was going to work. Now, another thing that complicates this issue is that the argument is not over nuance. It's not over detail. The argument is over two opposing narratives, two histories that are diametrically opposed. Well, if they're diametrically opposed, only one can be true. Well, how do you sift through this? Somebody asked me once, it seems like the stories are so different. Is there anything that we can read that might show, you know, some kind of a compromise? You can't have a compromise when you have two histories that are diametrically opposed. You can have compromise if you're arguing about over details. Now, the story that I grew up with as an Israeli, and the story that is taught in the West, is that after the Arabs rejected this plan, and we, the Israelis, we, the Jews, we accepted it because we're gracious. See, we deserve the whole country, but we agreed to a plan that gave the Arabs some of it. So we were actually in the spirit of compromise. Now, the Arabs rejected this, began a massive attack to destroy the small Jewish community that was in Palestine at the time. And somehow, because we were better prepared, because perhaps we are culturally superior, within 12 months we were able to not only prevail and defeat the Arab armies, but establish a Jewish state in our homeland for the first time after 2,000 years. Wow. You know, it's so powerful, it's so romantic, which is why so many people in the world have accepted it and liked the story. As an Israeli, we take our identity, we, we suck from that story, and it is a big part of who we are. This heroism, this Jewish heroism. We, the descendants of King David and the descendants of the Maccabees, we did it again. This is how it's taught. And in my particular case, my father was a commander. He was a young officer who fought at that time. So, of course, there's no question that this was heroism. But as we mature, as we, as we grow up, hopefully we mature, and then hopefully we are able to take a closer look, to examine closer the details and the stories that we were brought up with. And a closer look shows us this. The two communities in Palestine at the time were both hoping to become states. They were both beginning to establish um, institutions of state.